Okay. Welcome to the SCORE Fall 2018 webinar on Open Educational Resources. Today's presenters are Berkeley City College Librarian Heather Dodge, who will discuss the Berkeley City College initiative and the opportunities OER presents for faculty to produce meaningful texts within a community college context. And CSU Channel Islands professors Jamie Hannons from Nursing and Jacob Jenkins from Communication who together will be presenting the OpenCI initiative and discuss creating and contributing to OER publications and projects in relation to the RTP process. So at this time, I'm going to hand the floor over to Heather from Berkeley City College, who is going to start today's presentation. Okay, now can you hear me? Can everyone hear okay? I can hear you. Okay, yay, great. Um, so my name's Heather Dodge, and I am, um, I'm just gonna try and share my screen with you all real quick, if I can. Um, and let's see, is everyone seeing this full screen or is it not coming in full screen for you all? It's not full screen yet. Let's see if I can do it full Started screen. Started as a uh, slide share, or slideshow. Hmm. Oops. Mm, I think I'm going to leave it for now just because I don't want to mess with it too much and take up too much time. Um, but you guys can you guys can see my slide. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, great. Okay. So. Um, like I said, my name's Heather, uh, Heather Dodge, and I'm from Berkeley City College. I'm the head librarian there. And um, this is actually a collaboration between myself and Jenny Yap, who has also been helping with our OER initiatives. Um, but she is sick today, and so I'm sort of taking the helm. Um, so if I'm fumbling through a couple slides, it's uh, because they're part of her presentation and also um, because we just had to emergency close our campus and evacuate because of really poor air quality here in the Bay Area. Um, but I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about how OER um, fits into the scholarly communications context within community colleges, um, which may be a little bit different than the perspective that you'll get from the CSUs. Okay. Uh, so I kind of wanted you all to start thinking about how uh, scholarly communication and OER are connected. And so I'm seeing that a few of you have already brought some things up in terms of um, the way that faculty can engage with materials, the way that OER kind of addresses equity issues. And so I'm glad that there's sort of, you know, a baseline understanding of, of what OER is. Um, so I have to say that I knew basically nothing about OER until about two years ago when our Vice President of Instruction passed along a granting opportunity to um, apply for a small grant uh, of about $20,000 to encourage faculty to adopt OER through professional development. And that was the AB 798 grant, which at the CSUs is called um, ALS, or Affordable Learning Solutions. So um, we started out basically by getting thrown some money and told to spend it on OER. Uh, and we didn't necessarily know what we were doing, and, and we tried a bunch of different things. And I'll talk to you guys a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, but we got that grant and then we applied for a state chancellor, a, a, a community college chancellor's grant for zero textbook cost materials to see if we could plan a degree pathway for students at BCC who would uh, not have to pay at all for their texts. So um, we had that um, and uh, we basically had those two rounds of funding. Um, and through that, um, during about three semesters, we cut costs to students by $250,000. Um, and this impacted students in about 55 sections 
uh, with about 2,000 students being um, impacted by OER materials. Um, we worked with a lot of faculty and had about 22 faculty on our campus uh, adopt OER in their classes. And that was just sort of where we started with everything. And it was one of those times where, you know, you just put a lot of stuff out there in terms of we did a lot of professional development, we held trainings, we worked one on one with faculty, and we didn't really know what was going to come back until um, at the end of last year when we really started looking at who had adopted OER and looking at uh, the impact that it was making on students. Um, so that's basically what we did is it was sort of like a two phase process. And I'll, and I'll tell you that I, I, we sort of, this looks really organized in retrospect, but we really fumbled around for a long time. Uh, so we started out by training our librarians to be OER experts. And, and I see a lot of um, overlap between the research that you do to help a faculty member find OER or adopt or adapt OER and the work that librarians are already doing in terms of helping faculty and students find materials, find articles in databases, um, site materials. So we felt that was a sort of a natural bridge for our librarians. Um, we also held OER workshops and on professional development days and had several workshops going throughout the semesters on different themes having to do with OER. Um, then what we did is we did some really targeted outreach. So we looked at GE courses so courses that would transfer in the IGETC or the CSU breadth from community college um, and those courses that already had some good robust OER and we did outreach to those faculty and presented them with um, basically several different OER materials, whether it be textbooks or modules or full courses or, you know, Canvas Commons materials that were related to their class. Uh, in nice little packages that were, you know, tied directly with the learning outcomes and the course outlines for their classes. Um, and then as we started sort of learning who was already using OER on our campus, we worked with those folks to have them be sort of our, our advocates. So then the second phase of our process is that um, we are in a four college, community college district. So we reached out to the other three campuses to find out what was going on for OER on their own campuses. Um, and we started building partnerships between our faculty. So we would take, um, we would match faculty that were on our campus with faculty that were at College of Alameda or Merritt College or Laney who were also interested in OER or who were using OER so that they could talk to each other. And building those networks and those connections were some of, that was some of the best work that we did because um, faculty really want to talk to other faculty in their disciplines about OER and how it actually plays out in the classroom. So that worked really well. Um, and then the last things that we did is that we incentivized uh, faculty through stipends and course releases to create, adapt, and remix their own OER. So if their course didn't have OER that would work, we uh, we gave them a course release or a stipend depending on what worked for them and what worked for their dean um, to create those materials. And so that's also worked to help sort of build OER and it, and it put something back out there. Um, and now we're sort of in another sort of like sustaining process where we've built a community of practice across the four campuses to uh, continue working on OER and build our capacity. Um, okay, how's everyone doing? I feel like I just talked a lot. Hopefully everyone's okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess that this, the, this sort of, I don't know how many of you are from uh, community colleges or, or how many are from four-year schools, but Tenure at community college is based around service and teaching. There is no real research or publishing component to it. 
So this is a huge distinction for community colleges. And it's one of the reasons why it's been very difficult for us to get adoptions in courses where there isn't already pre-existing OER. Because there is no time and no incentive built into our tenure process to allow for faculty to publish and get any kind of credit for it in terms of, um, at least at our, on our campuses, uh, around publishing, whether it be OER or traditional publishing. If someone is doing that, then that's great, and they're definitely, you know, commended for doing that, but it's not required. So, but what we found as we started doing outreach to faculty, especially in community colleges, is that they want to do research, they want to publish, and they want to contribute scholarship to their disciplines. And OER presented this very unique opportunity for them to um, adapt materials, write their own materials, um, and basically contribute something or create something that felt new in their discipline. Um, it also allowed them more academic freedom. So if they had used a traditional textbook that um, maybe didn't include culturally relevant examples or had um, you know, photographs in it that didn't represent the students that were sitting in their classes, then they could go out and use an OER text and find their own open source images that represented the students in their classroom, or change the examples in uh, an OER text to fit the context of their own students. So that was, again, another kind of opportunity uh, that we were surprised that faculty found that so fulfilling. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, so um, I feel like I just created like a very rose tinted picture of OER on our campus. Um, I can tell you that some of the biggest hurdles that we faced and that we are still facing is that faculty at community colleges simply do not have time or the, or the ability to change their texts. So if you're a part-time faculty member and you work on three different campuses, um, you are likely not going to have time to change your text nor do you feel the incentive to, to want to do that. Um, that said, I think there's a desire for folks to change and remain, con remain up to date in their discipline, but there may not be the actual time for it. Um, another huge problem, and this ties in really closely with scholarly communication, and I don't have a great answer for this, but as, um, as someone is adapting or adopting or remixing a text, there's multiple different platforms where they could do that. It might be um, press books, it might be Libra texts, maybe they have an institutional repository that has an authoring tool, but there's no great one-stop place to learn how to or to actually adopt and adapt an OER text. Um, so we had faculty that were just, you know, creating a Word doc or um, you know, creating something in Canvas Commons, but there's not a great place and platform that sort of everyone is using to do their publishing. This also kind of ties in with the fact of making materials accessible. So that's both accessible to the public and accessible to students with visual impairments um, or with hearing impairments. So that's something to just think of um, is as materials are being created, that faculty really need to be mindful of making things accessible. Okay, so I would say um, in sort of the bigger picture, and the reason that I really love working with OER and working with faculty that are using OER, um, is I really strongly believe that OER work is equity work. And what I mean by that is, I don't see, as a librarian, 
I feel like my main job and goal in life is to bring equity onto our campus. And if that means um, encouraging faculty to use lower cost textbooks, then so be it. If it means laptop lending, then let's do it. If it means, you know, giving out hot spots to students at the beginning of the semester and letting them use them for the whole semester and take them home because they don't have Wi-Fi, wi then let's do it. Um, but I really feel like OER is the place where we can make a huge impact on students in terms of the financial barriers that are put in front of them to um, attend and complete their classes. And um, the second thing that I would say is that, and this was very unexpected, is I, I didn't realize that as a librarian, I would spend a lot more time being an advocate for OER. So that means, you know, putting out tweets about OER and attending conferences, going to meetings where we're talking about different campus initiatives and talking about how OER fits into that initiative. And that's sort of been a big piece that I've been working on is in the community colleges, integrating OER into our guided pathways, into um, AB 705, which is essentially eliminating pre-transfer level courses and encouraging students um, to move quickly through transfer level courses um, and into our strategic plans and equity plans so that the term OER becomes kind of commonplace on our campuses. Um, and then the other thing that I would sort of like plant a seed in is this past year um, Elsevier bought the digital commons. Um, and so what that means is that the content in digital commons will always be OER or open access if it needs to be or if it is licensed that way, but that Elsevier owns the infrastructure that provides access to those texts. And I guess I'm at a point where I'm like, we really need to think who owns infrastructures and think ethically about how information is created and information, I know, yeah, so I see Tonya Farrell says that she didn't know that Elsevier owns Digital Commons. And it's interesting because um, B Press, which is part of Digital Commons, um, or used to own Digital Commons, B Press was purchased by Elsevier. Uh, and they're right across the street from our campus. And I'm like constantly sending them bad juju because why would they let Elsevier, Elsevier buy them? Um, but maybe someone who knows more about scholarly communications knows the answer to that. Uh, so, oh, you can't see other people's comments. Tonya Farrell's comment was actually just sent to all panelists and all she said was, wow, I wasn't aware Elsevier owns digital comments. Um, so Claudia, you, I can see your comments and so can the other attendees. So yeah, so we need to think about as we're creating materials, where are they going and who's owning the infrastructure that creates them. Um, and that's, I think that's about it for us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take questions now or we can hold them. Lana, I don't know if you wanna hold questions until the very end or if you wanna, um, if you wanna take questions now, I'm, I'm happy to do it either way. I know that Jacob, and Jamie have a great um, presentation as well. So maybe we wanna hold questions until the end. Yeah, let's go ahead and hold questions and hear from uh, Jamie and Jacob, and then we can do questions at the end for all the presenters. Great, let me uh, share our screen and then I'll Can everybody see that? Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. So thanks for having us. I think um, we are going to maybe speak about some of the same things that uh, Heather just spoke about, but maybe from a four-year university perspective. And then, of course, uh, turn the corner hopefully at the end and talk specifically about the RTP process, which is what um, I think our initial sort of prompt was. So more specifically, in order to do that, if you'd advance a slide, maybe one, Jamie, just a very brief introduction about who we even are, just so you, you know, know who you're listening to. And then some background on the OpenCI initiative, including uh, strategies, strategies and successes, as you can see, just what we've been up to and um, 
you know, some nice successes that we're proud of that we've had the last couple of semesters. And then, like I said, turn the corner to the next steps about RTP, about potential challenges, and uh, maybe even open it for the discussion at that point. So with the introductions, um, again, quite briefly, we have uh, Jamie and myself, you can see in the image there really quickly, we are both, uh, just to clarify, the Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative Campus co-coordinators here at CSUCI. Um, and that's uh, CSU Channel Islands, four-year public university. And I'm an associate professor of communication, Jamie, associate professor of nursing. And the one person that's not here with us, at least want to make sure we pointed out, is Jill Leestead, who is uh, really the director of everything that we're doing over the Teaching and Learning Innovations Group and OpenCI Initiative. And uh, I think, Jamie, I'll hand it off to you, and you can maybe give them some background on what I even mean when I'm saying OpenCI. Okay. So OpenCI is really what we um, really brand named our efforts here on this campus. Um, as Heather kind of implied, um, those of you that don't know, um, or maybe many of you already do know, um, the Affordable Learning Solutions has um, grant funding annually for the CSUs that we apply for to support textbook affordability initiatives and um, OER as well as um, the AB 798 grant that Heather mentioned is also a grant that we applied for both with the initial round and um, bonus funding to also support our initiative on this campus. So all of the funding to support some of the efforts that we're talking about today that have been made over the last couple of years, this is our um, the beginning or kind of halfway through our third year. Uh, we both became the co-coordinators um, just in some of our involvement in some of our other roles. And our uniquely co-coordinators, um, I think a lot of the CSUs have various roles from either the library or um, maybe from their technology team where they have the coordinators um, lead, leading their effort on their campus from that role. And um, I believe there's only one or two other campuses that have faculty in this role, which we feel has been really a success and a benefit on our part, partly because of um, the role of the faculty person and how we understand what other faculty are doing and not that these other roles don't, but that we also have some connections across disciplines in a different way and can loop people in a little bit differently. Um, we do, of course, team up with teaching and learning and technology in the library and the bookstore and everybody that we um, can across campus and even more recently in the last year, um, our basic needs initiatives towards meeting um, and thinking about students' needs. And so we can talk about um, that a little bit more, but these were really our three kind of key um, components and much like Heather was talking about, um, this was really not organized this way from the beginning. We started down a path of just trying to deal with cost and reduce textbook costs and really um, kind of over the pathway of the last two years have realized that much of our work focuses on these three aspects affordability quality and equity and really um, it resonated with me Heather the the idea that this is equity work and we're really working on kind of some social justice issues um, which has been much of our work and um, research and exploration that we'll talk about in a little bit the last year or so. In doing that, um, this kind of maps out so you can see we have the bigger CSU Affordable Learning Solutions um, funding and grants and that comes through for our campus which it may it may be different for other campuses but um, it funnels through the teaching and learning innovations um, kind of pathway and then OpenCI is what we branded and named um, our effort on our campus so that we could really have kind of a visual representation across campus about what that means. And then you can see over on the right, it filters out to many of the things that we've been doing. So we did a lot of faculty development early on, trainings, um, just informational sessions. We started our ambassador program, which has evolved from a really a face-to-face -face sessions into um, a blend of a Canvas course that they do called a five-day workout, which you'll see the logo for kind of on the bottom. And, um, and then we have some face-to-face -face meetings and trying to help faculty redesign their courses, find resources, whether it be OER, library resources, or combinations of um, what they're using. We developed a website. We've tried to talk to student government. We have that no cost course materials button. And we had a different icon originally, but really 
felt um, in trying to align with our community college partners and really try to make the, the information seamless for students that might be transfer students, which we have a high population of transfer students on our campus, to recognize what that logo means. We changed over to the one that the community colleges use. Um, and we are very excited that this year we launched our two um, first in the CSU open CIZ majors. So there are pathways in both the communication program and early childhood studies program, which uh, Jake will talk a little bit more about coming up um, in how we did that. But there is a pathway for students to complete those degrees in the major required courses without any cost. So that's really exciting. Um, I can share the, when we get to questions, I'll share the link to this presentation and um, there's actually an interactive timeline you can click on here if you wanna find out more about kind of the pathway we've gone down the last two years. But um, I'll hand it back over to Jacob to talk a little bit about our strategies in more depth that I've mentioned and our successes. There we go. I was trying to get unmuted. And uh, in some ways, I think it's a little bit of a repackaging of some of the stuff that Jamie was just mentioning. So you had to talk about the strategies and then some of the successes that she's already hinted at. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Jamie. That'd be fine. Here's three of maybe the biggest successes that uh, we identified just in chatting briefly over that we've identified from the last year or two. As you can see, the uh, ambassador program on the far left, the campus-wide research study in the middle that uh, Jamie's alluded to all these things, and that middle one is what I really think ties back to what Heather was talking about, about equity and advocacy, even though they all do. And then um, also, as Jamie said, the uh, first two Z majors. And if you go to the next slide, though, Jamie, this is another way of looking at it. Um, I'll try to be brief on this, but again, this is all retrospective in that we didn't have we didn't have this much clarity in the beginning, I don't guess. So you kind of look back on it and we made sense of what happened. But as we do look back, we see it breaking up in almost five different steps as far as um, what our uh, process entailed. So at the beginning of step one, there was these campus-wide initiatives where we kind of threw out a um, almost a shotgun approach just to invite all faculty from all programs, if they want to redesign their courses, we had stipend, we had help, we had workshops, things like this. And so then, this is also along the very bottom, you might see, this is also aligned with Ev Rogers' Diffusion of Innovations Theory, if anyone's familiar with that. So as we look back, we really felt like it uh, you know, aligned nicely with that theory in that you have the innovators, those people that are prone to change and not scared of change and are on the cutting edge of these things. They adopted and we wrapped those right in. Then we turned the corner after about a semester or so and we formalized that call a little bit more and that's where we had the ambassador program 2.0 because we called all of our faculty ambassadors who redesigned their courses, but the 2.0 program was more of a cohort model and it focused less on simply saving the students money, but also on the educational aspect of it, of educating the faculty and thinking about it from a pedagogical perspective of the benefits of OER pedagogically beyond cost savings alone. And that really seemed to turn the corner on really creating, again, from that cohort model, just a stronger base of buy-in and people who um, you know, knew what they were doing and could educate others and sort of spread that word on what the options were and strategies were and things like that. And then as we continued, you can see step three, we almost retrospectively then realized we sort of had a groundswell of support began to develop within a couple areas on campus. So it wasn't as if from the very first semester, we decided, hey, we're going to attack communication and early childhood studies and some other program, and we're going to make them become a Z major. But we started noticing these natural ground swells of support that were developing within certain areas on campus. And um, so at that point, we also identified an early majority. So we uh, outlined program level action plans for these programs. And so in communication, for example, without getting too much detail, because I'm actually trying not to spend much time on this slide, we uh, decided to redesign all of our public speaking courses, for example. It was a three-part plan, so it was a public speaking courses, because we felt like that that was our gateway class. Uh, our average public speaking textbook was almost $150, $147.57, and that just seemed way too high. And so there's a lot of saving uh, potential there, of course. And then also another part of the plan was to leverage the ambassadors we already had in order to um, you know, spread the um, 
the potential for OER use. And so that led, that program level plan is what led to a Z major within the communication and a Z major within early childhood studies almost simultaneously. And then step five is you know, what we're at right now, we would say, and that's, as you can see, sustaining, scaling, celebrating, because now we have these two, ma two Z majors. Uh, we are anticipating uh, health sciences. It will be officially a Z major this coming fall. We are, you know, we're in talks with a few other programs. And so how do you scale that in a way? You know, me and Jamie are only two people, so we can't do it by ourselves. And then, um, uh, and then the idea of celebrating just really quickly, I think, I personally think is a very important part that sometimes is overlooked because you do good things and you don't even give yourself a pat on the back sometimes when you reach some sort of, you know, benchmark. And so we're consciously and mindfully trying to pause and celebrate and give people credit uh, for the jobs well done in order to kind of keep that morale and the buy-in and whatnot high. Um, go to the next slide, Jamie. And of course, chime in. So I think now we had a couple of slides just, uh, you know, digging into the ambassador program, just one slide for that. And um, a couple of slides about the research project that we mentioned a moment ago, and a couple of slides about just the overall results we've had then. So this gives you a little bit of an idea with the um, ambassador program, just to, we created different videos and different resources to help them um, to find their own resources. But you might have something to add about this, Jamie? Yeah, I just, one of the things that I think when we're thinking about scholarly communication, um, you know, how we're sharing out materials, I think is one of the challenges that Heather would have talked about as well. But even for us, trying to make sure that faculty from all stages can find resources and mm -hmm. that um, although we really encourage OER and want OER used, um, and definitely want them contributing to publication of OER. One of the challenges is how do you get someone in the door? And I think one of the things we're trying to do is offer different, just simple steps. How can they find resources? Where can they go? What can they look for? Both for students and for faculty. So this is an example of one of the things that we've um, tried to do um, mm -hmm. to get that word out, I think, so that we can meet those different levels like Jacob's been talking about in our um, perspective of, of the kind of progress of innovation and where we've been with getting faculty engaged. And then of course, one of the other things that I've mentioned that I'll let Jacob get back to though is um, the research that we've been doing about our campus and our students tying back to that issue of equity. Mm -hmm. And this is a nice quote, you can read it for yourself. Uh, While the advantages of OER and student performance may be difficult to dispute, there's far less clarity on whether student outcomes are similar across all student populations. So as colleges become more diverse, disaggregated performance data will be essential in understanding the efforts. Um, this is just a nice quote, I think, and one of the things that got us thinking about this, because if you all are familiar with OER research that's out there, to oversimplify it, uh, essentially all the research is controlling for aspects of difference because it's such a new area that they're looking at whether or not the OER material is as good as a traditional textbook, whether or not it has as good of impact on student learning outcomes, you know, the impact on student satisfaction, depending on what the research question or what they're looking at, they're, they're just trying to compare these two things and they're intentionally controlling for these aspects of difference. And we, uh, Jamie and I both work at a Hispanic serving institution. We have a uniquely high number of racial ethnic minorities as well as first generation college students, as well as low income college students. And we were really struck by the need, just as Iwako, uh, ECOA says here, is well, what impact might this have on certain populations that we're not looking at yet? So instead of controlling for that, we're almost intentionally doing the exact opposite with the study that we have uh, over 700, uh, 705 undergraduate surveys collected at this point, um, about 20 interviews, we're definitely gonna get to 20. And on the next slide, just to give you some preliminary results of it, um, yeah, and actually we didn't put in the quantitative, we've done all the analysis, but to oversimplify it, to try to just give you the nuts and bolts, what we're finding is that cost is a significant barrier for all students at CI. So this is if you're looking at just the univariate results, um, not breaking it down by any form of difference. And I think, Hopefully in this sort of group, we all know the correlations between cost and classroom success uh, with a uh, first day access and the effect that that has on graduation rates and success, uh, student loan debt. So this is just true for all students regardless. But then basically every statistically significant finding we're having is finding that the textbook costs are an even greater barrier on those historically underserved groups. So whenever you look at it through racial ethnic minorities, uh, in our case specifically Hispanic Latino, if we're looking at low income, first generation, um, almost, almost every question we're asking 
they are experienced more stress, for example, they um, are less likely to, they're more likely to not buy a book because of the cost. They're more likely to not buy a book knowing it's going to hurt their performance. They're more likely to feel like not buying a book has hurt their performance in the past. They're more likely to report having failed a course because they couldn't afford the book. Uh, they're more likely to avoid taking classes, which again is getting back to time to graduation rates and things like this, just on and on. Um, some other maybe more interesting, I think more interesting things with the third point there, uh, less academic capital. This is something we're still working through a little bit, but there were a few questions and a few results that we didn't anticipate at all, and they were confusing at first, and this is how we're making sense of them as of right now. There, uh, Some of the results, for example, showed that Latinx and first generation reported a statistic, statistically significantly reported that they had to buy more textbooks each semester and reported that they spent more money on textbooks each semester. And at first pass, that doesn't seem to make any sense that because you're a first generation student, you would magically be drawn to classes that require more textbooks and whatnot. So you know, after thinking it through and even after our interview data and talking with other faculty anecdotally and other staff anecdotally, um, we're, we're working through this idea of maybe a theoretical extension of academic capital in the sense that academic capital is typically understood the capital from your education. So because you have your doctorate, you're asked to give a talk or because you have your master's, you're more eligible for something. But we're thinking of it as a theory as extension of that as more uh, during the educational process that they have mental models they have mentors they have understanding of how to navigate the educational landscape perhaps and um, and so then again first generation students have less of that academic capital so they find themselves going to the most expensive local bookstore and just buying every book that's listed in the syllabus whether it's required uh, suggested just mentioned you know the just to cover their bases. And um, so we think that that could be interesting. It could be an extension. It could be a practical help as well. And we ultimately want to dig in more to our, to our interviews, which we're just starting to explore some of the why behind this. So we have the numbers to back it up, which the numbers were sort of assumed before, but they really, it wasn't actually out there because no one actually looked into it yet. And then ultimately with the last point, um, most importantly of all, I think it's a challenge to each of us of what we're going to do with this, because like I said, it might have been assumed that issues of affordability had certain impacts on certain students because of socioeconomic status or whatnot. But now we actually have the data to back that up. So as we look at our syllabi that have a $120 book or three books or four books, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge. And uh, what are we going to do about that now? Um, the next slide is about, I think, um, yeah, some of the results in those Z majors. So again, Jamie mentioned some of this. Uh, we have three infographics here in total. So this is the first one that's a little bit of a broad infographic with the results so far from the OpenCI efforts of uh, two Z majors in the upper left. You can see communication, early childhood studies. I think these numbers are as of about a semester ago. Is that right, Jamie? So, um, so if anything, you know, we're definitely over a million, for example, on the bottom left at this point, uh, well over a million, but that's, you know, these are still gives you a, a ballpark. Um, 60 plus faculty, a little bit over 18 programs. And then, and yeah, and that's fine, Jimmy. And then specifically, if you look at uh, communication, if you dig into that, um, the Z major, we have 27 no cost courses, as you can see, um, 90 to 100% of the faculty, depending on how you look at it. And then about a quarter of a million, and actually it'd be well over a quarter of a million at this point, just within the communication program since we started. And then with early childhood studies, just how those numbers shake out. It's a little bit smaller of a program, but 100% of the faculty there. And because it's a little bit smaller of a program, uh, a little over 100,000, so well over 100,000 at this point in savings for the students. And I think I saw it was hard for me to keep up. I can't see it's hidden down there, but I think maybe, yeah, someone's already asked, answering it, what a Z major means. Yeah, it means that there's just a, a zero cost course uh, co uh, path through the required courses. And so back to Jamie for some next steps and some thoughts and challenges. So, and this is more, this will lead into our discussion. It's really kind of our last slide here, but um, we really wanted to go back to that idea of um, scholarly communication and the idea of publishing OER. Um, as Heather said, the difference, you know, in the incentives may be a little different, whereas here in this DSU, uh, much of our RTP process really does have to do with research and scholarly publications. But one of the challenges, I think, um, 
that we've discussed is how do faculty get credit for all this work that they're doing. So we have all these faculty that have gotten buy-in and are reducing their textbook costs and they feel like they're making a better course and they feel like their student engagement is different because they've integrated a, a combination of content or they've integrated and are using OER and they've really um, honed into what their courses and their student learning outcomes are and they've made a better resource for them. Um, and in thinking about that, you know, moving forward, we really want to, and our plans are to continue to collaborate with um, other campuses. We've tried to do some collaboration and gotten involved with some of our local area community colleges. Um, continuing the collaboration even just on our campus with digging deeper and how can we how can we make bigger impact with students as I mentioned before like our basic needs efforts and having some conversations with them about what does this mean if we know our students are struggling with meeting basic needs how can they pay for a textbook um, tying to our 2025 graduation initiatives across the CSU looking at continuing to have students involved, um, both from the perspective of how can we help them and inform them, and um, what can student government do to help kind of drive some of the issues that they may see as barriers. Um, some of the OER publishing options that we're starting to address, and we're really looking in the spring to have a speaker series, both to open up the conversation about the importance of OER, but also to talk about some of the options with publishing. So can you, you know, can we use press books? Um, on campus, we have a open journal that's been started, I think about a year ago now. So um, where and how can faculty engage in this kind of work? And then the question that follows for many of us is how do they get credit as far as their progression of the RTP process? And where does that lie? And, and I guess we don't have any answers for that at this point, but I think um, what we wanted to do is really bring that into the conversation with this group and say, you know, what is happening elsewhere and how are people navigating this um, environment where we want people engaged in publishing open, but we are concerned about a lot of faculty that are saying, but will it count? Um, and I think that's, that's a difficult place to be in. And I think if this adds to that, Jamie, I think one of the things that I'm figuring out in my conversations with you is that there seems to be a misunderstanding that I've fallen into over and over and over that's almost pitting open against peer reviewed and where actually those have nothing to do with each other or they're in no way correlated. It's more of like a uh, quadrant of four squares, you know, that it can be peer reviewed, not peer reviewed, open, not open. But so, but there's this kind of it people oftentimes jump over when you say open, they think not peer reviewed, so it doesn't count. And um, so in some ways, uh, I'm still trying to figure it out because our, from a four, from our perspective, our university, the RTP process is almost universally just say that it needs to be peer reviewed mm -hmm. and they never say it can't be open. But again, there's this, there's somehow by saying it has to be peer reviewed, people think it can't be open, but these have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. And one of the discussions we've had, Jacob, too, was that idea that but is there a certain perception that mm -hmm. the peer reviewed paid for kind of closed journals, right, are better quality or are considered, you know, um, higher as far as um, rating and, and maybe weighted differently. And that's of concern as well, um, because does peer reviewed, does any peer reviewed equal any peer reviewed? And, I, and I'm not sure um, that that's always perceived that way. Mm -hmm. So um, we can hand it back over to you, Lana, if you want to open it up for questions or um, we can look at the chat. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the three of you. This has been a really great program. So we have uh, one question that came up in the Q&A function that's for Heather, which is, um, hello, Heather, how do you cultivate relationships with early adapter faculty who use OER? Can you give an example or two? Desperate to do this and looking for all leads I can find. So this is from Sherry at Florida Atlantic University. Okay, yeah, I saw that one. And I think, um, you know, I think we can, I, I'm just putting it in the, the chat so everyone can read it. Um, 
And I think we can all kind of speak to this in terms of how to cultivate relationships with early adapters and I'm thinking adapters and adopters. Um, I would say that one of the things that we did is we paired folks who were interested, faculty that were interested in finding OER, we paired them with one of our librarians and um, the librarian actually asked the faculty members for a syllabus and looked over, you know, what materials they were using, what the current textbook was, and then um, the librarian would go out and do kind of like a selective search for materials um, and give those to the faculty members, sort of as like a short list, because I think one of the overwhelming things that faculty encounter as they're starting to look for materials is that there's so many places to go look for OER. There's OER Commons, there's um, Canvas Commons, there's Cool for Ed, there's Merlot. Uh, so kind of sifting through those became a barrier to a lot of faculty. So that's, that's one example, is that we had uh, librarians create short lists. Um, and I'm trying to think of another example. The other example that I would say that we did is once faculty found material that they thought was interesting, even if they weren't ready to adopt it whole cloth, we had them write up a review. So we had them actually look at the material and talk almost in as sort of as a, as a peer reviewer, what were the strengths of the material, what were areas where they were seeing deficits, and um, just even writing that review for them set, set aside some time where they could think about critically what the material was, was um, what, the, what the benefits or, you know, the lacks in the material were. I don't know if that answers, you know, I don't know if uh, Jacob and Jamie have other, other specific examples. Jamie? I, I was thinking you might have an example. <laughs> I'm dropping in a link right now for our Google Slides to the, uh, to the chat. Oh, thank you. Question about our results. I mean, I, I guess the only other, um, the only other way that we, I, we've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations trying to really um, meet the needs of individuals, right? So I think it's hard if you're in a group setting trying to deal with, um, I don't know, I guess in our group kind of faculty development sessions, there's questions that come up, but sometimes there's individual needs based on the content that they're mm -hmm. looking for or certain faculty that we've had that struggle with finding maybe instead of some of the GE type content, they're struggling with finding specific content that they're looking for for their courses. And I think just trying to link them into others you know, um, to find you know other courses, other faculty on other campuses, um, just through our connections, sometimes is helpful. But having conversations with them about, I think sometimes having a better understanding of what they need mm -hmm. helps us um, figure out where to direct them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree. I think with what I hear. Jamie's saying is maybe the idea that it's uh, not a silver bullet and there's not one way of going about it is what I've you know learned throughout this whole process and because maybe one thing I didn't hit on as well as I could have in that five-step process that I showed you know several minutes ago now was during the very first step of that one of the things that we realized we did the most was just meeting with people for coffee and just talking about possibilities and ideas and where they're at and uh, Jamie has made fun of me I always use this example that I'm, the numbers gonna keep getting bigger I'm gonna get up to like 14 one of these days but I think I had like six coffees scheduled on my you know, calendar one day just with different people and she was just like that doesn't make any sense that's too much coffee but <laughs> we were just meeting to talk about where they're at in the process and you know what to do next and whatnot so sort of meeting people where they're at is a phrase I like a lot because some people are already in, they already get it, they've, well, I'll go step one step further. Some people have already been doing it for years and we didn't even realize, and we found that out with some of our math faculty especially, that they'd already been using OpenStax and we just didn't even realize. So you've got people like that that you can use as a great examples and exemplars to other people. Then you've 
got, as you move down the spectrum, you have people who buy in and just don't know how to do it. Then you have people that don't buy in and they're reluctant and you have people just all up and down. So I mean, where they're at, sometimes it's a matter of uh, just getting them, you know, over the hump to that next stage, depending on where they're at. And it looks like there's a question about how to start conversations with OER from Kelly for private graduate, private graduate universities. We can't get the AB 798 funding, but there's also a ton of, there's not a ton of OERs available at our education level. You know, again, I would, um, is there any way that you could encourage them to have conversations about creating and publishing um, their own OERs and uh, is there any incentive to do that? And I know that doesn't create a, a, an immediate solution, but I think that some of the struggles we've had is finding either um, resources that have um, problem sets or resources that are for specific, um, one of the higher level courses in a course, like I know for nursing, we have some struggles with content. There's pieces of content, um, you know, about arterial blood gases or about, you know, um, some specific um, test or study, but there's not an entire book. So I know that that's, that's challenging. And I think as we can continue to encourage and grow um, this idea and the conversations of OER across higher education, we have a better potential because we could share and it's not silo people working in silos. And I'm seeing now in the chat about the uh, authors, textbook authors. And honestly, you know, Jamie might disagree, but I don't know what to do about that one. <laughs> I can see, I guess I can see that perspective. Uh, I, I mean, I've written a book, but I don't use it in my classroom. So I'm, I'm not tied to anything, but I do understand if you've written a textbook and you feel like, first of all, you feel like it's the best resource and it's, you know, what you created. I can just kind of get that, even though from my understanding, I mean, I've made about $7 off of my books. So I don't think that they're, you know, academic publishing doesn't seem to pay that well, but oftentimes I can just see why you'd be attached to your own book. And we've got two or three that come to my mind without saying any names that I'm not sure if we're ever going to be able to get them away from their own book. And we haven't quite figured that one out. But we also have one recently that we thought would be attached and was okay. Yeah, you're right. Cause he was using his own book. So, and, well, I just think you that have to. Though, and I don't know what happened. <laughs> You have to kind of bridge those conversations carefully, but I, I guess my question from the perspective we're in now is I don't think I'd ever want to publish a book that isn't open at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm struggling with publishing with a journal that isn't open. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. having some mixed feelings about that. So I, I think it's, it's a, a difficult conversation to have depending on the, the individuals. I think there was a question. Um, I'm just trying to make sure we're covering everything. Mm -hmm. um, that if someone asks, uh, Lisa asks, have you ever had experience in handling actively hostile, fa hostile faculty who are textbook authors and who take OER efforts sort of personally as an attack on their ac academic identity? Um, I guess I could speak to that really briefly that um, I have had that. Um, and I've more had, I've also had the argument from faculty that students, especially at community colleges, that our courses are already, the credit units are so affordable that there needs to be some kind of barrier or some kind of hump that students invest in the course. Um, and I've also had, you know, um, especially faculty who have authored textbooks say, you know, that, that this impinges on, you know, copyright and all sorts of issues like that. And what I would say is that it's it's not a um, it's not a one way street. It's not one or the other. I know a lot of faculty that, especially in in English or literature disciplines, where you know they might be still teaching with um, a novel or a nonfiction book that's really important for their class. Um, but they've adopted um, a rhetoric text or a citations text that's open. So it's, I don't think it's an all or nothing in terms of OER and uh, allowing faculty to kind of see it as a gateway or an additional choice 
is um, a way of showing them that this expands academic freedom as opposed to limiting it. And that our, our academic identity isn't built around copyright. Our academic identity is built around our ability to freely engage in discourse and share ideas uh, in a way that's, that's more open. So it is a little bit of a different approach, but I would say it's not a, a full stop, if that makes sense. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to go ahead and combine two of them, though. Uh, so there was a question earlier about um, strategies for reaching out to uh, faculty who are teaching online classes. And then another one on locating and identifying faculty who are already using OER but haven't reported, reported it to the uh, campus that they're using it. So I think um, we haven't targeted online faculty specifically. We have um, looked at some interested programs that wanted to do the zero cost major or were really close where they only had a few courses to get there because we had a lot of engagement from faculty in specific programs like communication. And um, so then we targeted those faculty. We have not specifically targeted online faculty um, just because I just, we haven't gone down that path yet. I think that is a route to go. Um, I know some other campuses also look at high enrollment courses, high drop fail courses, um, and other courses that might have, it might have bigger impact on. Um, and in regards to, um, in regards to getting faculty to report, one of the things that I think has helped us um, find out more for faculty that really were already using um, OER before we even were on board as co-coordinators for OpenCI was that we um, have the no cost button. And so it's the State Assembly Bill 1359 that requires us to provide information for students. Um, and we used an icon that is in the course catalog that identifies those courses or sections of the courses if it's um, not every section of the course that are no cost so that students have that information up front. And I think that has been motivating for faculty to get back to us to report. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe if this isn't too broad of an answer, my gut reaction was just talking to people. And I know I was saying a moment ago, there's not like a single silver bullet for getting people to adopt. And so I know there's also not a single approach, only one way of doing things from our perspective, but my kind of style or my approach seems to be to just have coffee, talk with people, you know, drop by their office, you know, and that's, I swear, that's how I found out everything I know about who is using things and who's not, because you just talk to them about it and you find out. And we've tried some more formal efforts with like sign up days and different things and uh, and they were good ideas and we got some people dropped by and reported but i think we found out more just from talking with people and that led to talking to somebody else and kind of snowballed in that way i think the one thing i could contribute to that is um same as channel islands we had sort of a cohort model uh, where we had oer institutes that were two days long and we stipended faculty to attend and they um, worked in disciplinary clusters to identify OER and then they were each kind of tasked in between the institutes to go back and test out using a chapter from an OER book or um, creating an assignment based around an OER text or something like that in their class and then they showcased it to other faculty in their discipline. So it was a nice way of kind of building clusters in disciplines and then having those clusters go out to their other faculty colleagues and share what they'd learned about OER. All right, well, thank you everyone. And again, the recording for this um, webinar will be posted to SCORE's YouTube channel and we will send that out through the SCORE listserv when um, it is posted. Um, so if you could all join me in thanking Heather, Jacob, and Jamie, uh, this has been a really thought-provoking presentation, and we hope to see you at the next SCORE webinar in the spring. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.